I'm going to teach on a hard subject tonight. And uh, I mentioned a while ago the phone call I had with a very, a very dear saint of God. Turn to First Peter while I talk, catch my breath after that song. First Peter chapter 4. Um, the phone call I had uh, is in my heart and is in my mind. And this person asked me a very difficult question. And um, I, like to, I like to think that I know the, I know the answers, or I know the Bible verses that have the answers. And uh, sometimes I don't. But this one, it's a, it's, a hard, it's a hard thing to understand because of who we are and where we live. We live here on earth. And we cannot even see into the next five seconds, much less the next five minutes, next five hours. We can guess that in five seconds, we're all still going to be here and I'm going to still be talking. See? I was right. Not bad. Okay? We can also guess the next five minutes, we'll be doing the same thing. Five hours, hopefully, we'll all be home. That's our, that's our forecast. But do we really ever know that? The answer is no. So we don't know the future. We don't know it. We can, we can see in the scriptures what we know, because we trust God's word, we know what he said is going to happen, and it's going to happen exactly the way he said it. But if you were to ask me to sit all down on a map, from God's word, everything that's going to happen in the end days, I couldn't do it. Because I don't see all of that. I don't see it as clearly as I'd like to. So what I have underlined there up on the screen and what we're going to look into tonight, next Wednesday night, next Wednesday night, is the will of God. What does God have planned? And is God always sovereign over every single event that happens? Is that always what God wanted? Is it always, was it always his plan? In other words, the day that you went and did something stupid, okay, you went so far out of, out of God's word. You did it. There's no denying it. You knew better. You knew not to do it. And you did it. Was that God's will? Because that's what was asked me. Because they asked, what if somebody does this and it's absolutely wrong is this the will of God it's a big question what I said was it happened it was why did I say that okay that's what we'll get into big big stuff here because we're trying to know the God who knows everything. And when I say everything, count the number of stars. God has a name for every one of them. The number of atoms in those stars. The number of electrons in those atoms the number of quarks and bosons in those electrons in those stars. God knows every one of them. And he holds them in the span of his hand. And there, that's knowledge that I cannot even fathom. I lose track after, what, 10 or 11 things? Right? If you've got 10 or 11 things that you're doing, you're going to lose track. I like to think I multitask, but the truth is, there's no way I'm good at it. Something's going to get broke in my hand. Shut up, Sterling. Quit laughing at me. Okay? That's just me. It's my nature. So for me to understand 
the will of God and the mind of God, but I, I have it here. Amen? For as much then, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That much we know. For he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And a question that you could ask yourself is, have I ceased from sin? Have I ceased from sin? Okay, that's a question for you to ask you. All right. Uh, obviously, as we get older, the things that our body wanted or our mind wanted or the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes isn't quite as good as it used to be. It doesn't quite have the, we don't have the nature that we used to. We don't have the strength or the will we, that we used to. But there are other sins other than lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. There's pride of life, and that's easy to get into. But anyway, the question is, have you ceased from sin? That he no longer should live the rest of his time. Think about that, because we have a time appointed to us between now, this very moment, and our end on this earth. And who knows that? We don't know that. So he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. What does God desire? And is there a difference between what God wants or what he, let's say what he desires and what actually happens? Let me put it to you like this. Is there a difference between God's commandment and men's obedience to that commandment obviously obviously so then the question is is there a difference between what God desires we have we are made in the image of God so our heart operates a little bit like God's heart operates there are certain things that we want that are right and good amen but do they always happen no, no. Okay, so then, are there things that God does, and there's, I have a verse in mind. Are there things that God desires to happen that never actually happen? And the answer, according to the Bible, is yes. And I'll read that verse to you in a minute. But... This is not the first time in 1 Peter. We're going to go to prayer in a minute. This is not the first time in 1 Peter that he's mentioned the will of God. but And he always, in 1 Peter, mentioned it in the scope of suffering. 1 Peter 3. For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. And then later on in chapter 4, verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. Did you look at that? That suffer according to the will of God. Does God will for you to suffer? And the answer, of course, is yes. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. This is one is what I was talking about earlier. We're taking something that is very precious to us. And that is our soul. And we learn that we don't trust ourselves with it. Isn't that what we learned? We learned that when we got saved, or we should have learned it when we got saved. We should have realized, if you go back and think about the time when you surrendered, that you didn't trust yourself with your soul. You stopped doing that. That's why you asked God to save you, because you realized that you were not going to save yourself. It wasn't going to happen. And guess what? It's still not happening. You're still not capable of saving yourself, which is why you still must entrust your soul to the hand of God. God, keep this for me. Okay, what is that song we sing? I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able... To keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That was our soul. That was the, outside of our family and our friends and the things that we love. That's the most important thing to us. 
if others around us die and go to hell, that's sad, but it's not as bad as us going there. Because God's given each one of us a desire for, for us to not live in torment for eternity. That's what I, that's what I came to the conclusion of. It's not, that's why I didn't, that's why I wanted to get saved. Wasn't because I fell in love with God. Wasn't because I wanted to read the Bible every day. It's because I didn't want to go to hell. That's salvation, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're drowning, there's nothing wrong with wanting someone to pull you out. So, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. If God created it, he can recreate it. Father in heaven, we're going to try to understand you. And Father, we're not you. As far, Lord, when I fathom the universe, and when I'm being told that as far as we can see with those telescopes, that that's not even the end of the universe. As far away as that is, and as high above us as that is, that's how high you are above us, and how high your ways are above our ways. So God, there is, we understand that there's no way in the world that we're going to know what you know and understand what you understand. We can't see five seconds into the future, much, much less five days or five weeks or five years. And so, Father, we have to walk in trust. Just like we sang tonight, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Father, I pray for the person that called me today. My heart is aching for them and for the things, God, that they shared with me in confidence and for the, the battle that they're fighting and the thing that they are going through. But I understand it. And Father, I'm thankful, dear God, that uh, you've allowed me and others to already go through things like they're going through. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you would bless the words that uh, I said. God, that you would bless the scriptures that I gave. And Lord, you, you just open up their heart and help them, dear God, to trust you. And Father, it's hard because we don't see what you see and we don't understand. But Father, that's what our faith is. We trust you. We trust you with our soul. We trust you, Lord, with the things that are most precious in this world to us, things we don't want to lose. Father, we, we trust you with that. We wouldn't be here tonight if we didn't. Father, open up our eyes and give us, Lord, a little bit of understanding about who you are, how you do things, why you do things, and help us, dear God, to see that in our lives, not only in the past, but, Father, as we go down the road of the future, God, that we, we understand from the Bible, Lord, how you're working and what you're doing. And that gives us hope and confidence, Father, that you'll continue until the very end. Father, we love you and we trust you tonight. We pray, Lord, for your guidance in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, what I said earlier is, in God's heart, does he desire for things to happen that don't actually happen. And I said, yes, but can you think of a verse of why I said yes? And it has to do with the will of God. Second Peter three nine. Look there on the screen. Okay, yeah. Same verse. So God's telling us He doesn't want any of us to perish, but it's up to us whether we do or not. I just thought of another verse. I thought of a double witness, so let's read this one. Second Peter three nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Aren't you glad of that? And in everything that I'm teaching you tonight, I don't want to teach doubt, I want to teach faith. And I want you to understand. Faith and trust God. When, 
when we make a promise, we slack that promise, like slack in a rope. We slack that. We try to get out of that or we try to half do it and say we did it. That's our nature. We skip over some things. But when God makes a promise, he leaves nothing out. He is not slack in his promises. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. You can count on that. That's what hope is. Hope is the understanding that God will do what he said he will do. That's our hope. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing, there's the word will right there, not willing, that's why I gave you that word, will, not willing that any should perish. So, in that statement, God's heart is that no one perishes. And that was another question asked me today. I'm going to tell you what, I had a, I had a doozy of a phone call. But I enjoy, I, I was blessed in helping. I was blessed in, in listening. It's just good when God comforts you through something and then you're able to comfort somebody else with the same comfort that you were comforted with. I love that. I don't. I don't regret any of the road that I've been down on as far as knowing that God was leading in that every step for a reason, for, for a, re a good reason. All things do really work for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So and as far as I do have regrets, but as far as God's purpose is concerned there's no regrets of my part God is long-suffering not willing that any should perish so it is in the heart and the desire of God that no one no one do you think of a judge think of a judge who has to take a woman who has killed her husband because he beat on her so bad and her children that she could not take it any longer and she shot him. He has got to judge her according to the law and follow the law. Do you think he wants to put her in prison? Not a chance. Not a chance. God does not want anybody to be in hell. Nobody. Ezekiel 33. Turn there. That's the second witness. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, a question that was asked me is, what about people who have not heard the gospel? And I said, number one, read Romans 1. Because I don't understand it, but God says they know. And if God says they know, I trust God. Number two, because this person mentioned Hindu people in India. You know, Pastor Rock is over there preaching his guts out to people who hate his guts. And they're not listening. He's getting a few, but India is not known to be the Bible Belt. And Paul wanted to go east. Did he not? He wanted to go east. He would, have went, he would have gone into India. Maybe even into China. And think about the last 2,000 years of India and China and Japan. And all of that area's history. The last 2,000 years since Christ and the apostles and the church. Think about those people. They have been so resistant to missionaries, to the gospel, God was right. And I thought of this verse. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Nations. Nations means peoples, tribes, kindreds, races, types of people. And you've got people on this earth that consistently have shown 
that they despise the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have slain missionaries. They have outlawed Bibles consistently. Paul wanted to go east and God said, absolutely not. God was apparently right. Paul would have wasted his efforts and God knew it. Now, I'm not against those people. What Pastor Rock is doing over there, I, I want him to keep doing it. That's his people. He loves them. And for that man to be set, you know, you heard his testimony. He was one of them in an orphanage. And had it not been for the gospel being preached to him, he would have been just like them. But he is despised over there by his own people. Because for one reason, that is his religion. It's not his color. It's not, it's not how he talks. It's his religion. They hate him over there. So two things in my mind. Number one, God says they know. They just forgot willingly. For this, Paul said they are willingly ignorant. Romans 1, you read Romans 1, it says that they know. And that in the creation, it can be seen. Okay? Because when you and I get up early in the morning and see the sun rise, and we look out over what God's created, we worship Him. We go, God, you are awesome. We don't say, wow, evolution's awesome. Well, 33 million gods did that, made that. One God made that leaf, and one God made that rock, and one God made that sun. We don't believe that. We believe it. We praise and honor God with that. They are willingly ignorant. They've turned the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man, corruptible beast, four-footed creeping things. So that's what they did. But Ezekiel 33, um, verse 11. Boy, this is, this is deep stuff. I'm tell, I'm, listen, listen, I'm glad I came to church tonight. I'm glad you came. I'm glad you guys are online with us. Verse 11, saying to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Look at God's heart. God has to sit and judge every nation and every kind of people and every individual person. He has to judge them and he has to say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I knew you not. And then he has to listen to them scream for eternity. And you and I, in Isaiah 66, I believe that we're going to see the lake of fire. And we're going to abhor what we see in there for eternity. I don't like that. So our heart is modeled after God's heart. And if you think it's easy for God to judge someone... And because of their deeds, condemn them to an eternal hell. You look at that verse, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's God's pleasure. That's why he said here, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he says it here, have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way. That's repentance. And live, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Guess what? The hardest people in the world for God to condemn to hell is the Jew. Because they're the ones he personally pled with. He personally visited them when he came and lived here for 33 and a half years. He personally dwelt among people that he had to condemn. Jesus sat and looked over Jerusalem and wept and mourned over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, how would I have gathered you? Okay? But he said, you've slain the prophets. Everybody that I sent, you killed them. And so the heart of God and the nature of God, from what I can see, is that his desire is that every man turn and repent and live. But that's not what happens. So then, does that mean that God is weak? God is impotent? God is incapable of controlling the outcome of history? Is that what that means? 
No, because we have other statements in the Bible. I'm thinking of Pharaoh. I'm thinking of Judas Iscariot. God specifically raised Pharaoh up for a purpose. And God, you read Exodus 14, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Read Ezekiel 38, when God takes a hook and puts it in Gog's mouth and drags him down to Jerusalem. God's in charge. Okay? Um, look at the life of Nebuchadnezzar. Great, huh? Look at Saul. Okay? Greatest, here, here okay. Nebuchadnezzar, wickedest, wickedest king that God used to go and, and bring his children into bondage. And yet, by Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is on his face worshiping the God of creation, saying, there's only one God, and I know who it is. But then you look at Saul. Saul, who God put his spirit in and turned him into another man. But then Saul, because of the unwillingness to hold on to God's word, God had to take his spirit from him, rejected him. Saul ended up in witchcraft, taking his own life. Okay? But all of that, all of that together is the plan of God. Does that make you understand something? So let me separate two phrases. The will of God, I think, would represent his heart and his desire. The plan of God is the outcome of every event that happens from the moment of creation to the end of time. Does that make sense? In other words, it's as if God wrote it all in a book. And did he not? Because the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. So to say that God's will is that he ha has a heart, he has a love for his creation, he wants all of mankind to be redeemed, to be saved, for God so loved the world. Not just the saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that is, you see it in Ezekiel 33, you see it in 2 Peter 3, 9, you see the heart of God, his desire, his love for his creation. But God gave man a terrible thing. Choice. Gave him a choice. He didn't give tigers and lions and kitty cats a choice. But he gave man a choice. He, didn't not, he did not give angels a choice. He created Lucifer the way he was. He created Michael the archangel the way he was. He created them all to do exactly what he wanted them to do. But he gave man a choice. But does God know all those choices? Absolutely, because he knows the plan and the outcome of every event ever. Whew. How big is God's brain? If the universe is here, okay, technically your brain is about this size, right? Okay, so God's brain apparently is as big as the, the known and unknown universe. I, I, I'm going to explain something I said in the prayer a while ago. I listened to some people. I listened to astronomers talk. It interests me. And the images that we get from this various telescopes, seeing all those distant galaxies, those specks that we know are billions and billions of stars, they have a guess that what we can see 13 billion light years distant is not even the end of the universe. It's only a dot 
there's a difference between the known universe, that which we've able to see with those space telescopes, the difference between the known universe and what is beyond that. And they, their guess is that if you were to do this, here's the whole universe, here's the known universe. That's how big, that's how big, okay? And I, I don't mind thinking that way because the flat, or I didn't want to say that, the, the other people <laughs> who say that this dome over the earth is it. This, there's a dome, like a, they, they say like a, what's that thing you shake up? A snow globe. They say, that's it. And then God's right here on the other side. That's not very big. I don't like it. I hate it. It doesn't work. I like that what we can see is this big. And what really is, is this big. And God holds all of that in his hand. And that's how big his mind is. That's my God. Amen. Deep, deep, deep stuff. Turn to Galatians. <clears throat> there are some things about the will of God that I think are relevant to know. And I'll say the will of God for us as his people. Okay? Galatians chapter 1. Um, this, these verses here go along with what we just saw from 1 Peter. 1 Peter, you have three verses where it talks about the will of God and all three times it's talking that we are have, that suffering is part of God's will for us because we know what it does for us. Do we not? Do we not know that suffering makes us better people? Do we, do we not know that even the self-inflicted suffering that we have, the things we've done to ourselves now have made us better than what we used to be? So Galatians chapter 1 verse 3 Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So God's will is, has always been to deliver us from this present evil world. And I want you to think about, I'm going to blow your mind again, think about the word present. Who remembers 10 minutes ago when we were talking in this room? Who can, I'm not saying, I'm not asking you to remember the words I said, but can your mind reel back to about 10 minutes ago and remember us talking about the will of God? Is that still present or is it past? Define present. It's exactly right. Even if it's a millisecond gone, it's no longer present any longer. Present is always a moving car down a highway that never stops moving until it gets to the edge of time. And then God recreates a new heaven and a new earth and it's going to be without time. We're not going to have the knowledge of time or the passage of time in heaven. And we can't even comprehend that. We can't even define the word present because we're never, we're, we're, we're always moving past it. See what I'm saying? But we are in this present evil world. Whew. It blows your mind, doesn't it? Accor but it's according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you, we are in a very evil world. Okay? And it's getting worse. The things I heard today, I, I, my mind is on this phone call. It was, we probably talked for probably a good 40 minutes. And I, it, this person called earlier while I was at the hospital. And I just had a feeling that it was going to take a while. So I let the call pass. And when I got here is when I called back. But... I suspected things that I now know to be true, that even in the quote-unquote Christian world is very dark and very evil. 
and some friends of ours are being influenced by that. Okay? You know, you would, if I said name, you would go, yeah, I know who that is. Okay? But, but they're being influenced. And it's hurtful when you see people that you love walk away from what you know to be true. It, it's painful. It hurts. You grieve over that. Okay? But let me tell you something. That person is going according to the plan of God. Or it didn't happen. Did I get killed five minutes ago? Was it in God's plan? See what I mean? If it happens... It was in God's plan because he is able to take all things and make them good to them who love the Lord. So that's where we, this is where we, tr we don't see it. We don't immediately know it. We don't immediately think it. But that's where we stop and we trust God. 1 John chapter 2. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes is verse 16. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is the, think about that. It's not of the Father. And yet, God is the one who put the tree in the midst of the garden. He put a tree with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in it. And said, don't eat that tree. Knowing, knowing. That Eve and then Adam would partake of that tree. Knowing it. Not guessing it. Not hoping they wouldn't. Knowing it. So. Those things are not of the Father. They are of this world. So we separate this world. Where is our Father? We say it in the prayer. Our Father which art in has he ever left there? No. He sent his son here. He sent his spirit here. But he's never left there. In the realm that he is in, we cannot presently be a part of it until the redemption. We can't even see God's face here. The closest that anybody came to was seeing the face of Jesus. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the intermediate. He is the one that we can see his face and live. Like... The angel of the Lord talking to, to Samson's mom and dad. And they both said, we've seen God. Are we going to make it? They were worried that they were going to die. Okay. Uh, Jacob fought Jesus and said, I've, I've wrestled with God face to face. Am I, you know, am I going to die? No, he's not going to die. But we cannot see the father until the very end. When we're fully redeemed, then we can see his face. Finally. But right now... We are in the world where the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is. And it is not God's will that we partake in any of that. But it happens. Verse 17. The world passeth away and the lust thereof. Thank God. But he that, but, now contrast. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Are you seeing this? It is not God's desire that you fulfill the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So, now the, now the question, but I have, and I continue to do so. But we separate the two eyes. The eye of my flesh in this present world but there's something new on the inside of me that does that did not come from this world. It was not conceived in this world. It did not come from this world. Its genes were not part of this world. It came from God himself. It is the new man. It is the inner man. It is Christ in us. It is that which is born of God which sinneth not. The Bible says. My mind is blown already. 
Because I have to, I have to always consider that as a born again believer, there's two of me. The one I love and the one I hate. I'm, t- I'm tired today. Sitting at a hospital for two days straight wears you out. Okay? And I got up this morning and I thought, I'm going to call Rose, tell her, call everybody I ain't going. But that wasn't where my desire was. My desire was to be here. You see that? My flesh is wanting to go home. Go to bed. My bed. Not a stupid couch on a... Oh, good grief. Huh? But the flesh is bingo. I mean, not bingo, but you know. The flesh is weak. It has to get up and go to the bathroom, doesn't it, Wayne? Yes! Right in the midst of the best talk in the world. Sorry about that, bud. Love you. I love that guy. <laughs> How many times have I been teaching and had to run off and go to the bathroom? Okay. But our flesh is our flesh is awful. It's part of this world and it's never leaving. Understand that. Put that in your heart. Okay? Wrap that around you and know that that, that inner man in you is serving God always. It sinneth not. And it's renewed every day. But this outer man, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And it requires more operations. Sterling's got to have surgery again November 13th. Bless his heart. It requires more maintenance, more medicine, more health care, more premiums. And it's still, the death rate in this country is still 100%. But the inner man never dies. That's what God is taking out of here. Keep, always keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. Romans 12, turn there and we should be done. Boy, it's been good, hadn't it? I I needed it. I needed it. Romans 12. Look at this. Now, in Romans 12, I'm going to... I'm going to say something that maybe you have not heard or maybe you've heard something different and maybe you're going to disagree with me. Uh, I will love you anyway because I don't see it the way that I was told it. I don't see it that way. Romans 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means kill it, crucify it. Tell it no. Tell your flesh no. That's what fasting is good for. Telling your flesh, no, I'm not, I'm not giving in to you today. I'm not, I'm not listening to you today. You're not, you, you just go away today. Because me and God's going to have a talk. And it doesn't include you. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He did not make this impossible. And, be not, so, and in that sense, we're priests. But we're also the sacrifice. Just like Jesus was. He was the high priest, but he was also the lamb. Rep, think about that for a while. Blow your mind with that. Okay, which, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? See, that's that inner man, renewing of your mind. The inner man is renewed daily with knowledge, the Bible says. That means you learn a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more every day. I'm not done learning. I'm not done learning. Okay, there's more things that I, I keep learning, keep knowing. I like it. I, I want to keep, keep my mind sharp that way. That you may prove what is, watch this now. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I have heard that God has three separate wills. His good will, his acceptable will, and his perfect will. And they're different. And, and somebody said that you can be in the acceptable will of God, where God says, well, I'll allow that, but that's not really my plan for you. And I do not agree with that. I think all three are adjectives of will of God. 
They're all three together. If it's good, if God says it's, it's good, it's acceptable. And God doesn't accept anything that's not good. God doesn't accept a sacrifice with a spot on it. It's not acceptable to him. We, we need to understand God's standard is ex, it's as high as the universe. It is very high. That's why to us, it is impossible. It's as impossible for us to conform ourselves to the will of God as it is for us to leave this world in a spaceship and go to the edge of the universe. Not even in Star Trek do they ever leave the galaxy. I know my Trek a little bit. They've never even left the Milky Way. The Klingons and the Vulcans are all there. They've never been outside this little ring of stars, ever. It's that hard and that difficult for us to conform ourselves to the perfect will of God and be accepted by our own plan. Amen? So God's standard is that He does it in the inner man. He qualifies the inner man to be good, to be acceptable, and to be perfect. Be ye perfect, therefore, as I am perfect. And I struggle, as a young preacher, I remember struggling with that. Not under, I would, I had this conclusion that if God said we had to be perfect, then at some point I would be perfect. And I've never done that. Never. So I had to rethink. And I had to go back to the scripture and learn what he meant. It's the inner man. That's what's transformed. That's what's changed in you. You're out. Listen, I'm looking. At, I've known you, some of you for years. Your outer man's getting worse every day. And so is mine. Shut up, Wayne. It's getting worse every day, bud. Okay? But it's that inner man. And I think good and acceptable and perfect all qualify the will of God. If it's acceptable and perfect, then it's good in God's eyes. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's why this all is embedded in here. But to think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I told this person. I said, you know, I, I, I really do think God has some people out there that are about 40 times as good as me. And I said, I have no doubt of that. But I'm not one of them. And I said, God did not make, and I have a, I have a pastor friend who's learning this now. He's learning that God did not make him strong. He thought he was, like I did. He thought himself stronger than he really was. And what's happened is God's afflicted him. And he has told me, he says, it's been the greatest experience of my life because I realize I'm not the man that I thought I was. Whew. For a man of God to come to that realization, God's going to use that man. Because what he's going to do, he's going to attract people who already know that they're not all that. We already know that here. So God does not allow us to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think because we know who we really are. We know what we're capable of. So we think soberly and there is a measure of faith that God gives to people. With some people, it doesn't require a lot. They just automatically believe everything God said. But with others, sometimes it's a struggle. And God has to increase their faith and give them a different measure. Understand that, and you'll learn to love people when you understand that God did not make us all the same. He did not make us all with all the same capabilities, all the same faith. We have to have our own measure of it in order to get there. 
and some it requires more than others. Okay? It's like the lady that came, to, I can't remember who it was, but she was a harlot. And I think she's the one that she poured the oil on Jesus' feet, washed his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair. And Jesus said, she's loved me more because she's been forgiven more. And there are just some people that have been forgiven of a lot more than others. Okay? So you learn to love people that way when you understand that, no, we're not all the same. Okay? Boy, what a, what a lesson. What a lesson. Amen? And we're not, we're not anywhere, you know me, we're not done. We have a long way to go. Okay?